Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Afis, and before we start today's amazing episode of Rob Henderson, I want to let you guys know, go ahead and mark your calendars for Monday, December 13th, because I am launching my new project, The Standard. Guys, I've been telling you guys that we're working on a project. We have big things coming. We have a huge announcement, and this is it. I am so excited to introduce this new project to you. So many of you guys are going to be absolutely in love with it, so make sure you have your notifications on on YouTube so you can be one of the first people to find out about it so mark your calendars monday december 13th for our new project the standard and let's get started with this week's episode do women and men think that things are like dating life has it gotten better or worse and most women say it's gotten worse i think men are like 50 50 half say it's gotten better half say it's gotten worse i wonder why the the discrepancy there but um a lot of the young guys i see they're they're really not happy with what's going on i mean the numbers of uh ghosting uh, you know, ghost, you know, disappearing, like seeing someone and then never seeing them again. I'm, you know, this is happening a lot more too. the research is indicating because, you know, in the past, if you meet someone through a friend, and then maybe you're not getting along anymore, you can't just vanish because you have the same yeah. social circle, the peer group, you're going to see each other again, somehow just, you know, because you're in the same community. But with dating apps, you know, you can literally hook up with someone and then delete them from the app, block them on social media. And that's the end of it. Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Hafiz, and welcome to today's episode. I'm so glad that you guys are here today. And for today's episode, I am really excited about bringing in this young man to be able to share his ideas to you guys, because one of the biggest things that I found is that I've met so many older guys who are doing such amazing things. You guys know their names. I don't got to keep on repeating them. But what I really love is young men men who are in my age cohort, who are thinking critically about life, who are not only um, examining society, but also providing tangible solutions to society. So, man, words cannot describe just how excited I think this episode is going to be for you guys. The topics is juicy, so we're going to have a ton of fun today. So please, without further ado, welcome to the show, the one and only Rob Henderson. How's it going, Rob? Hey, I'm good, Hafiz. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, yeah. It's great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So, Rob, for those who don't know who you are and what you do, can you give a bit of an elevator pit synopsis about what you do? Yeah. So right now I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge here in England, uh, studying social and evolutionary psychology. Before I was at Cambridge, I was an undergrad at Yale, um, sort of doing the same stuff, studying psychology. I was working as a research assistant in a psych lab there. Uh, but before that, my life was a lot different, um, sort of grew up in foster homes in L.A., uh, bounced around a lot of different, you know, sort of chaotic family life situations, uh, joined the military when I was 17 and got out of there. Um, and, yeah, I, I had a just a very tumultuous sort of childhood and adolescence before sort of finding my way into college and uh, attending Yale and the GI Bill and then sort of landing here at Cambridge. So it's been a, an unusual path to higher education and I guess in some ways that gives me a unique perspective into maybe some of the topics we'll be talking about today. Awesome. How old are you, Rob? I'm 31. Cool. Same age yeah. as me. <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Some people think I'm younger, you know, so I, uh, I don't know what it is, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm I half Korean. So like, you know, sometimes like my girlfriend, so my girlfriend's Malaysian and she's like, oh yeah, Asian jeans or something like that. So maybe that's what it is. But you look, you look like you're pretty young too. Like, I don't think either of us look like exactly we're 31. So no, I mean, Younger that's a gift. I mean, it's funny because when we were probably, if you're anything like me, when you were a teenager, that wasn't a good thing. Because when we were 14, we were like, we were like seven, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, but as you get older, it's definitely advantageous because, um, you know, you, the older you get, you still retain your handsome youth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So you said you grew up in um, foster care. So were you in the foster care system from the onset of your birth? How was that? Yeah, I mean... So my, my mother, she was uh, an immigrant from South Korea, so she came to California from Seoul, uh, and I was born in L.A. Um, a couple years later, after you know, I was around three years old, my mother became really addicted to drugs. Um, mm. I never knew who my father was. I've never met him to this day. I've never met him. Uh, my mom just succumbed to her addiction, wasn't able to care for me. Um, you know, we, we were in this slum apartment in Westlake, which is a pretty rundown neighborhood in L.A., 
and our neighbors like basically heard me when I was a little kid just like like crying and like I guess you know my mom was just sort of neglecting me while she was doing what she was doing um so the cops came uh took me to a foster home in LA and I just sort of yeah lived in five different foster homes over the course of uh, about no, no no I'm sorry I lived in seven homes over the course of about five years um yeah yeah it was i mean it was a it was a whirlwind i used to think that i had only lived actually in um i think four foster homes but then my adoptive mother i was later adopted she showed me some documents from that period and i was sort of flipping through them i was like wait a minute i was in seven homes like i don't even remember Mm. all of this crazy stuff that was happening because i was so young and it was happening so fast and at that age it's just sort of hard to like encode those memories you know um and so yeah it was just sort of foster homes all around la Okay. And so yeah. what age were you adopted? I was uh, I was almost 8 years old so I was yeah, 7 uh coming up on 8 and I was adopted by uh this family in Northern California in this small kind of working class town called Red Bluff. Uh it's about 2 hours north of Sacramento, so way way north in California. Um yeah, this like working class family uh took me in uh sort of different environment the town. It was like working class, kind of like more more white and Hispanic. Uh, where I was growing up, my foster siblings were like more Hispanic, black, a couple white kids. Uh, so it was sort of different in terms of like you know more rural versus you know more like a city, and yeah. uh, the the town and everything. I think it was probably equally poor to be honest. Um, yeah. My adoptive family though they divorced a couple years later after the adoption. My adoptive father subsequently um, severed ties with me because he was angry at my adoptive mother for um, divorcing him, for choosing to leave him. And him sort of stopping contact with me was his way of getting revenge on her because he knew that that would hurt her. And so that was just really tough for me because it was like, you know, I grew up without a dad and then I had one for a couple of years and then lost him. And yeah, I mean, I took out my, you know, my sort of, sadness and my anger and all of this through you know getting in trouble at school not paying attention getting really bad grades getting into mischief with my friends and just a lot of a lot of like troublemaking stuff man I was smoking cigarettes smoking weed like taking pills I was like nine ten years old when I started doing this stuff oh, wow. um set you know set a house on fire with my friend uh when we were little kids uh, we were nine I was nine he was 11 actually at that time um yeah, I mean, it got it got really bad. Um, and a couple of years later, so that was the divorce. Um, and then my mother, my adoptive mother, uh, took care of me, sort of raised me as a single mom. And she fell in love with a woman uh, named Shelly, who um, helped to take care of me for the next few years. They created this kind of stable home environment for me. Um, I mean, you know, other than the fact that, you know, it was like this lesbian couple, it was basically like a traditional family where we had dinner, you know, we had family dinners every night, you know, they'd ask me how school was going, they'd keep up on my grades. And, um, for those years from about nine, 10 years old to 14, um, I, my, my, my life had kind of stabilized and it was reflected actually in my grades. They started to improve. I started to um, pay attention to schoolwork and stuff, um, started taking it all more seriously. But then um, the summer before I was to start high school, uh, Shelly, so my sort of second mother, um, my mother's partner, she was shot. And so this was like a really tough experience. Um, we weren't she sure. She was for shot a while. and killed or just shot? She was just shot. We weren't sure if she okay. was going to survive. So. She and my mom and some of their friends, um, yeah, they were at a shooting range and, you know, there's basically an accident. One of their friends wasn't paying attention and the gun fired and, you know, hit Shelly in the back. We weren't sure what was going to happen, um, whether she would live and if she was going to live, whether she'd be paralyzed. Um, she did survive and just had to go through like a ton of physical therapy and stuff to sort of slowly uh, recover. But she was really like serious injury and just the whole experience of that, um, the sort of subsequent financial, um, instability that we experienced, um, you know, cause Shelly couldn't work anymore. Just a bunch of stuff, uh, um, emotional, financial, all this stuff going on in, in, in my house, my family. And 
I mean, again, it was all sort of reflected in, in my grades and my, my attitude towards school all throughout high school. I was just a totally, um, you know, the really bad student. I mean, I graduated high school with a, I think a 2.2 GPA, like the bottom third of my high school class. Um, yeah, I mean, my friends all had kind of maybe not quite that extreme of stories, but you know, my, one of my best friends was raised by his grandma because his mom, his mom was a drug addict and his dad had gone to prison. My other friend was raised by a single dad um, who had been married five times before we graduated high school, married and divorced. Goodness gracious. Sort of, yeah. Um, another one of my friends was raised just by a single mom who had boyfriends over at the house all the time. And, you know, he just um, he was really lonely and his mom never sort of looked, paid attention to him. So all of my friends and me were just like in really bad uh, home environments. And we sort of, I guess, created... Um, our own little community amongst our, you know, each other, but that just sort of found, we just found ways to get into trouble and sort of forget about what our family lives were like. Um, Mm. Yeah. One of my, my other friend, he was raised by a single mom and his younger brother would hang out with us sometimes. And his younger brother um, was like actually the opposite of us in many ways. He would get straight A's. He would pay attention in school. And then, um, my senior year of high school, he was a grade behind us. We found out that he was shot because he tried to join a gang. And oh. for them, I guess, like part of the initiation process was playing Russian roulette. And oh, he lost the game. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was just crazy because I, you know, I, I hadn't yeah. spoken to that kid in a couple of years. Just, you know, fan, friends kind of drift apart or whatever. And when I heard that story, it just blew my mind because I remembered, you know, him in like middle school just being this really good kid. So, yeah, I mean, I guess... I guess like all of us to say that my, my personal experiences have informed my uh, views about sort of family and stability and all this stuff for kids um, just yeah. because I didn't really have one. So, no, oh, man, that's, that's a story. <laughs> and that's just the introduction. <laughs> right. yeah, but yeah. but no, nah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, man. So after college, you went to the military, correct? Uh, after high school. So I was 17. After high school, I'm sorry. Yeah, after yeah. high school, we went to military. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Then, so I was seventeen and listed right out. Okay, and then you feel like at during that time, that's what gave you like more structure. It helped give you some more order to the chaos, which was your life. Yeah, I mean, it was it was sort of a a, a decision, um, like out of desperation. I knew I wasn't going anywhere in in the town that I was growing up in. You know, I just I could I could sense that if I stayed there, things weren't going to go well for me. Um, and, and maybe to some degree I was right because a couple of my best friends from high school. Uh, so I had five, like five close friends. And of those five, two of them went to prison and, you know, one of them went joined the military and the other two, one of them was working at Walmart. He recently got fired. And the other guy, last I heard he was working at, at a, at a car wash. Um, I think he was mm. working like part-time at a car wash. So, you know, those were like my options, right? Like if I look at like here, are, like my five friends, each who kind of did a different thing, but those were my five choices. And I, I, none of those really seemed appealing to me, but the military was like my, my way out of there. Um, and then, yeah, so the military gave me this sort of structure. It, um, I, I mean, I, I used to think, I think when people think of the military, they think of like, oh, you know, there's there's this um, sort of discipline, this camaraderie, uh, mentorship, all of those things I think are really important. But also um, just having like predictability and having um, yeah, like like not being able to act out. You know, the military has very strict rules and it makes sure that all of the recruits are aware of the rules and the consequences for breaking them. And you have no doubt that they will carry out the punishments. And so um, you basically it it forces you to stay out of trouble in some ways. And so from like 17 to 21, I was like every time I felt like doing something stupid, I I knew that if I did, I I would get caught and I get in a lot of trouble. I get I mean, the military will throw you in prison for like like failing a drug test. Right. And Mm. so you can't really screw around in the military. Um, Yeah. And, and so that was like a good environment for me because even when I wanted to act out, I just couldn't. And Uh, yeah, by the time I reached my early twenties, I started to sort of mellow out a little bit and think and reflect more about what I wanted to do. So in many ways, I'm grateful to the military for just like pressing pause and like letting me mature a little bit and then like 
once I once I was able to be, I guess, like mature enough and more reflective enough to sort of think about what I wanted to do with my life. That makes sense. No, that's that, that makes perfect sense. So after the military, you go to Yale and and, and the, the thing that really brought you on my radar is I believe it was the article you wrote about luxury beliefs, because, I mean, that concept to me is something I've been thinking about so long. And for those who have not read the article or have not heard about it, can you basically explain what made you come up with this term and then what exactly does it mean to have a luxury belief? So we're going to take a quick pause from this week's episode to talk to you guys about our amazing sponsors over at Skillshare. Skillshare is a one of a kind online learning community where you can learn all types of skills from creative to design to business development and so much more. Men, the reviews are in and people have been experiencing transformation from Skillshare because Skillshare has so many practical courses that you can take today that can benefit you, like how to find your purpose course, like how to start your business course. There's so many things available for free right now on Skillshare. So go to Skillshare.com slash roommates to get your first month for free of charge skillshare.com slash roommate guys don't just be someone who's constantly complaining about life take it into your own hands and build yourself up get the skills to become the best version of yourself skillshare.com slash roommates you'll thank me later and let's get back to this week's episode right yeah yeah so so i did coin this term luxury beliefs um i um I've written a couple of articles about it. If you just Google luxury beliefs, you can find, um, you know, different articles I've written uh, about this topic. I define it as uh, ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of examples here, but, you know, just to, um, I guess, just to sort of build the idea and, and make it uh, more intuitive or, you know, basically... Historically, of course, the upper classes have always wanted to display their status to sort of show the world that I'm a member of this, you know, high social rank. And so, you know, 100 years ago, um, there was this a little more than 100 years ago, this guy Thorsten Veblen, he was an economist and sociologist. He wrote this uh, book called The Theory of the Leisure Class. And he wrote about how, you know, the, the, the elites of his time in, you know, the late 19th, early 20th centuries, they would sort of wear tuxedos and uh, evening gowns and jewelry and wear like a pocket watch, a monocle, all this kind of visible material goods that would loudly declare, like, I'm a member of this sort of uh, sophisticated upper class. Um, I think over time, what's happened is that luxury goods have become maybe less prestigious or at least um, sort of a, a little bit less uh, prominent in displaying status, less important in some ways. It still it still exists. I'm not denying that people still sort of wear certain clothes and whatever to, to show their status, but I think it's becoming less common. And I'm, my, my idea here is that now people display their status through their ideas, through their beliefs, through having unusual opinions or provocative ideas. Um, and I saw a lot of this, um, you know, when I was uh, at college, when I, I see it sometimes here at Cambridge as well, um, a lot of different kind of strange ideas. And, you know, some people ask me, well, is it true that the upper class care so much about status and showing off and whatever? Do they really care that much about this? And and actually, there's research indicating that they do. There's research, for example, in psychology indicating, you know, uh, that the, the people who occupy the sort of highest positions in society who have the most status and the most wealth they are the most interested in uh, obtaining more status and wealth and preserving the status and wealth that they currently have, which is maybe a little, you know, counterintuitive to what you would think, because, you know, you might think that people who are sort of at the bottom rung, who maybe aren't doing so well in life, those would, the pe those would be the people who maybe want status and wealth, but it's actually not the case. Of course, they do want it, but not as much as the people at the top. And in some ways, that's sort of how you get there and the top in the first place is because of how badly you want these things. Um... And so how do they express this? They express it with, you know, novel and unique ideas, sort of um, signaling against the the masses, you know, like the, the ordinary conventional middle class people. Oh, they believe X, Y, Z. So I'm going to believe in this other thing over here that's, you know, at odds with that just to show you that I'm not one of those people. I'm, I'm one of the sort of higher status, upper class people. Um, yeah. One example that I give um, in one of the articles is about... Uh, 
uh, monogamy in marriage. So I was talking to this uh, former female classmate of mine from Yale, and she was, you know, she's doing really well. She comes from a good family. She's working at a tech company, and she was telling me, you know, I uh, I think that marriage is is outdated. I think it's sort of this like outdated patriarchal uh, restrictive institution, and we can probably evolve beyond that. And I asked her, okay, but, you know, are, are you going to, like, personally, you know, evolve beyond that? Like, what are you going to do in your personal life? Are you going to get married or are you just going to do something else? And she said, um, well, you know, like, I'll probably get married. I'll probably find a husband and settle down and have kids. And basically describing this very kind of traditional, typical family life. And then I asked her, well, what kind of family did you have? You know, what was your life growing up? And she said, oh, I had a mom and a dad and, you know, they're always together, no divorces, remarriages, any, anything like that. And so I found this very odd that she came from an intact family. She was going to cre create one herself, or at least she was hoping to. But here she is sort of talking about, you know, marriage being outdated and so on. And I'm realizing, you know, that this is a perfect example of, of, of a luxury belief, which is, you know, she's yeah. sort of showing her how evolved and interesting and and different she is. Um, but meanwhile, in her personal life, she's still going to create a family environment that's going to be advantageous for herself and for her kids and, and so on. Yeah, and that's man. That was so good when I heard that. I was like, man, like there's so many layers to that idea of luxury beliefs. And and I and I think. One of the biggest things that I've noticed, especially online, especially professors and teachers, is a lot of people are, have a lot of theory. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're the, they have all these theories about poverty, theories about education, sex, marriage. A lot of people have these theories. And what happens is these individuals will teach, educate, you know, share their theories to those who are interested in learning them, and they're usually young and impressionable ad adults. And what happens is that these theories, when practiced and when applied, have negative consequences to the individual's lives, but the individual who's perpetuating these theories, they're able to live a life that doesn't have to apply that theory, you know? Yeah. And, and so to me, I've seen that happen so consistently not only in regards to business and, and but in regards to marriage, but in so many aspects where people who have who are in privileged positions can be able to propagate an idea, and then those who are young and impressionable will accept that idea, believe that idea, but the, but then the privileged people do well, and then the those who are not don't. And another, a, a simple example I thought about when I was reading your article about luxury beliefs was the whole, I don't want to have a kid. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if this falls into luxury belief, but I'm curious to what you think about this, but I, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people, you know, they will communicate, Oh, you know, having kids is outdated and there's too many people on this planet. And, and I don't want to subject my body and all these other types of, you know, neo Marxist ideas that they propagate about the problem with having children, having a family. But then these same people who are in their 20s and, you know, mid to late 20s who share these ideas later on in life, they have resources. They eventually settle down and they may be in their late 30s and they can't may, they may be in high risk pregnancies, but they have enough resources for, you know, in vitro fertilization, you know, surrogates, things like that. So they're able to at 37, 38, 40 change their mind and say, well, you know what? Actually, I do want to have a kid. But mm -hmm. then the other individuals who are in the least um, opportune situations who don't have the 30000 for the uh, in vitro fertilization, who don't have the money to change their mind, they suffer because they accepted the belief that someone once projected and then is no longer following later on in life. I love that example, man. I, yeah, I'm, I'm adding that to my list. You know, I keep a doc now of luxury beliefs and like ideas and stuff. And like, if, in case I ever want to write about this again, I love that. I mean, that's so good. I, I, yeah, it's so yeah. true because, yeah, if you're if you're a well off person and you put off having kids until your late 30s, early 40s or even older. Um, and even if you don't do in vitro, you can 
hire someone to be like a surrogate or or adopt i mean even the adoption process is is not it's not cheap right like there's it's still expensive. barriers you have to hurdle and, yeah. and there's like a lot of stuff you have to go through and and of course it'll always be easier if you're a person of means if you have sort of whatever economic resources or social access if you have the right sort of personal connections i mean all of those things that are that are um sort of advantages for people in in yeah. uh well positioned in society and so yeah, that's a that's a fascinating example. And it, it makes perfect sense. And I mean, yeah, I've seen this like multiple articles and multiple people now sort of talking about how they don't want to have kids, or there's something wrong with having kids or whatever. And yeah, I hadn't considered that these very people can can afford the burdens of carrying that belief. Um, I mean, it reminds me of you know, this this other idea that I that I wrote about in one of these luxury beliefs articles about, you know, this idea of sort of idea sort of spreading and, and creating obstacles for for people who aren't so fortunate. You know, I was reading the statistics about uh, sort of how many kids are raised with both of their parents. And so there's research showing, for example, that in 1960 in the U.S., um, if you look at sort of the upper class and the working class in America, uh, ninety-five percent of kids in the upper class and in the working class are both raised by both of their birth parents, uh, which which actually stunned me. You know, like the, the the percentage was exactly the same for both sort of upper and working class people. Um, and then if you fast forward to two thousand five for the upper class, uh, it was eighty-five percent. So it was ninety-five. It dropped slightly to eighty-five percent, but still the vast majority of upper class kids raised by both of their parents. And for the working class, it had dropped to thirty percent. So it went mm. from 95% to 30%. Wow. Uh, yeah. And that just, you know, it, and one of my claims that, that I've made here is, you know, well, what happened? Some people say, well, it's, it's an economic issue. Maybe to some degree it is. But again, the working class in 1960 weren't like doing that well either. But they still yeah. had, uh, they still got married. They still had kids and, and so on. They still had intact families. But I agree that there's a cultural issue here too. That starting in the in the early to mid 1960s, there was this idea that started to propagate about you know the problems with marriage and you know that that you don't need to have a father around, that you don't need both kids, you know, both parents, and so on. And of course, like the upper classes can afford that. They didn't always follow yeah. their own prescription. They would say these things, but not always adhere to them. The lower classes would would hear this message. They'd see it. It, it doesn't even need to be direct. It's not like, you know, the, the upper class people are going into working class neighborhoods and saying, you know, you know, you don't need to get married or whatever. It sort of trickles throughout the culture indirectly through um, through pop culture, through media, through movies, TV shows. I mean, I remember this this crazy uh, this, this fact I read about. Um, so I was reading for some or, yeah for some reason an article about I Love Lucy and how. I think it was I Love Lucy, this 1950s sitcom about how it was this yeah. like scandalous thing for uh, Lucy and Desi, her husband, Desi Arnaz, to be yeah. shown sleeping in the same bed together. It was the first time in TV this had ever happened. Like, oh, wow, so yeah. scandalous that a husband yeah. and wife would be in bed together. But yeah, back then, yeah. there was this crazy, you know, scandalous thing. And, you know, by the time you sort of look at sitcoms from like the 1970s, 1980s, and of course, modern TV shows, it's like just all kinds of you know, a lot of a lot of you know whatever uh, sexual freedom or promiscuity or however you want to put it, and I think gradually over time uh, people do pick up this message about like how you're supposed to live your life, what relationships are like, and so on. And um, of course, like again, if you're if you don't have um, sort of much in the way of resources or access and so on, um, minor minor uh, minor mistakes or behaviors or whatever can can really sort of throw you off uh, certain trajectories. No, that's that's true. And and I think that to me um, really embodies some of my passion. And I obviously see it in you as well, because uh, God has blessed me to be raised in a two parent household. My my dad is a superstar. My mom is an amazing woman. So I know how much that benefited me. And I like really yearn for everyone to be able to experience that. And what hurts me the most is that we've all seen the data. I don't I don't think anyone needs for us to go through the list of the negative consequences from children being brought in broken homes. And so to me, a lot of these luxury beliefs that are being uh, you know, projected into society, I see it is now destroying a lot of young men and women. Um, in regards to their personal everyday lives, in regards to having families and, and especially the lives of children. And yeah. one of the things I'm, I'm curious, because I want to definitely touch on the dating app stuff. Have you have you been seeing some of the um, the video content 
for for men who who are very um, anti marriage? Have you ever seen video content and stuff like that? Is this the like the MGTOW thing? Yeah, uh, the like MGTOW, the men... Red Pill, Manosphere, yeah. kind of that that general area of the internet that project a lot of those ideas. Are you familiar with any of it? I, I I've seen some of it and and sort of have have uh, you know encountered a little of it, but I yeah I I don't really get all of it. I mean, it just seems like a lot of like I mean I I whatever like I, I guess I do feel a little pity for them, but it just seems like a lot of like sad guys who you know, had like really bad experiences, but you know, but the, yeah, this idea of like, now you're going to like go on YouTube or whatever and like talk about how no one, like just because you had a bad relationship means no one should have one. That kind of stuff is really, I think pretty toxic. Yeah. And, and definitely we'll, I want to get into some of the theories to why these guys come about when we get to the dating app stuff. But one of the things to me that I've seen is that, you know, for a lot of Americans, you know, most people are going to have, families well sorry most people are going to have children like all, like majority of people are going to have children and mm-hmm. from just a financial um basis especially as inflation and things like the things like what's happening to the economy continues mm-hmm. it's, it's important that you know there is a team effort into raising the children and so mm-hmm. one of the things that i've seen from content like that is that there's a lot of a lot of individuals a lot of men who are projecting these ideas, right? These ideas of, you know, you can be a guy, you can just live on your own, you can, if you want to have kids, just take care of it, you know, get, get, send the woman money, whatever the heck you're doing. And I'm looking at who these beliefs are negatively affecting. I, I believe, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson said when the, when the rich sneeze, the, the poor get influenza during your episode, oh, yeah. and um, pneumonia, I said influenza, <laughs> pneumonia. And to me, what I noticed, especially in in the black community, a lot of these luxury beliefs within marriage affect um, those in the black community the most. So like the, the, the second wave or if not third wave feminism ideas of, you know, you don't need a man, you're it's independent, you can take care of yourself and raise your kids on your own. Yeah, maybe that works in theory. For some of them, but what happens is a lot of those in the black community, they're the ones adopting these ideas and they're and they're suffering from it. So in the same vein, I've seen that happening with a lot of the men. Like one of the biggest issues that I've talked to countless of people about this. And it's like one of the biggest things that's that's destroying American society, in my opinion, but especially the black community, is a single parent motherhood where young young men and women are not being raised with their fathers or in two-parent households. And so to me, it's like when people are projecting these luxury beliefs where individuals can just be by themselves and have kids with people and do whatever they want and it doesn't affect them. Maybe when you have nannies and maybe when you have all this money and maybe, you know, maybe in theory, quote unquote, that can work for some, but for the masses that adopt these ideas, that's leading to the continuous breakdown of society that's been affecting us and still affecting us today. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, there was a, it's an interesting article. I think it was earlier this year. Uh, David Brooks, he's a New York Times columnist, but I think he wrote this in the Atlantic about it was it was a pretty good line. It was something like, you know, if you want to summarize the last few decades of American society, uh, you could say that life has gotten uh, better for adults, but worse for children. Mm. Uh, you know, it's basically saying that, you know, adults have much more freedom uh, in terms of, you know, what kind of relationship structures they want to have or whether or not they, they want to get married and the option to sort of relocate and move around and so on. There's a lot, I guess there's, there is a lot more sort of um, freedom loosening of norms compared to the decades past. But, you know, what he was alluding to with the, the comment about children is that, you know, kids, do, yeah, like you said, kids don't have their, their parents anymore, right? Like a lot of them are raised in single parent homes or with grandparents or, or foster homes or whatever. I mean, it's really, um, it's really something you had to see just like how, uh, like how many kids now are, are sort of raised in, in, in these uh, uh, kind of non-traditional or atypical kinds of family structures. And I mean, of course, like it, it just seems inevitable to me that this is going to give rise to all kinds of, you know, societal disruptions and problems and so on. And I'm not even entirely sure I agree with, with this idea that life has gotten better for adults in the last few decades, because if you actually look at the research on happiness over time, it's kind of inconsistent, 
But a really interesting finding that I just uh, uh, was looking at was that um, for men since the 1970s, they've gotten slightly happier, uh, which surprised me. Although, mm-hmm. granted, I think this finding was in 2010. You know, so this was like before smartphones had taken off, before oh. <laughs> dating apps, before. Yeah. I mean, a lot has happened in the last decade, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in, in as of 2010, anyway, guys became slightly happier than they were in the 1970s, whereas women were actually significantly less happy than they were mm. in the 1970s, which actually was. Why was, do you was think that surprising. was so? I, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be um, I mean, it could be a variety of things. I mean, one possibility is that um, there's a lot of competition, right? Like it, it could be you know, sort of trying to get a good job, trying to go to college, like all of those things. I mean, I think. When you're kind of removed from it, it sounds great. But when you're actually in the midst of it, it can be pretty stressful. Um, maybe dating uh, has gotten harder in some ways. I mean, I have seen this. Um, so this is sort of more recent research from, I think, Pew that in like women in 2020 said that dating had gotten uh, harder in the last 10 years. So, again, so, yeah. so since, you know, between 2010 and 2020, women said dating got harder. I wonder if that was also true even in 2010 that dating had gotten harder just because the the rules and the norms around it have shifted. People aren't really sure what to do anymore. I mean, one one question that I like asking, um, you know, my female friends and just you know girls I know, like, you know, what like what do you do in terms of like paying for a date? And and I always get like such different answers from yeah. from women about like what are the norm, you know, like there are girls I know who say like it's not a date unless the guy pays. But then yeah. other girls will say, like, oh, I hate when a guy tries to pay. Like, you know, I can yeah. pay my own way. Thank you very much. Like, that kind of thing. Oh, gosh. And so, like, if you're a guy, it's like, yeah. okay, am I with a girl who says it's not a date unless I pay? Or is it, like, you know what I mean? And so, like, both yeah. sides here are kind of, like, trying to figure yeah. out, like, trying to maneuver and make the right move here to, to please the other person because there are no, like, formal rules anymore the way they, they – there kind of were in the past sort of expectations and so on. Um, and so – I think like that that could be one one element here too is just sort of like the dating but then also the sort of stress around uh, education and career um maybe has gotten gotten more stressful whereas like a lot of guys I mean uh, a lot of guys seem like you know more and more guys are dropping out of the workforce um sort of staying home I mean there's there's been research showing that like a lot of guys who are like actively I think it's been like per capita the number of men who are either not working and not actively seeking work yeah, has like grown something like I don't know twenty percent or more uh, per capita mm. since since the nineteen seventies, and these guys are just kind of like chilling at home, playing games, like on their computer or whatever. And if you ask these guys, "Are you happy?" Surprisingly, a large number of them say, "Yeah, like this isn't so yeah. bad." You know, like letting yeah. your parents pay the rent and like living in their mm-hmm. garage yeah. or basement or whatever, and just yeah. like you know playing around. Um, these guys seem to be content with that, but I don't think women. Uh, can experience happiness doing that. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of young guys can just, like, become, like, you know, blobs and, like, find some, <laughs> like, shallow, superficial happiness from that. Yeah. But I don't think women can just do the same thing. I think, like, they have, like, a different conception of what, what uh, happiness yeah. might look like. And so for them, this might be why, again, like, happiness might be declining for some of them. No, th- there's this uh, interesting story, and I don't know how true it is, but I heard it years ago, and I'm going to keep on telling this story. <laughs> and the story was there was a medical student who um, she went to, um, I believe she went to India to work with Mother Teresa in an orphanage. And I believe she was about to either about to start medical school or about to start a residency. I forgot the story. But anyway, that's for the sake of the story, she's about to start medical school. So she was a college graduate, about to start medical school. And so she was with Mother Teresa working at this orphanage. And she she said, you know, after her experience, she was like, Mother Teresa, you know what? I'm I'm not I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay here with you. I'm going to drop out of medical school. I'm going to be here because the children here are so poor. They're in such bad condition. They need my help. Hmm. Mother Teresa paused. She looked at her. She said, no. You cannot stay here because though you think the children here need your help, the children back home, this girl was American, need your help even more because Hmm. the physical poverty in the East is rivaled only to the emotional and spiritual poverty in the West. And so what I've seen in regards to what you're describing is that a lot of times when people talk about 
how society has gotten better, they talk about usually from a, a GDP standpoint, right? Yeah. In, in, in regards to oh, how many people are, are lifted out of abstract poverty. Now, obviously, those numbers are increasing. Society has been prevailing. But there is a spiritual and emotional sense of, of being that cannot be quantified and qualified at time. And I really believe those are some of the things which is causing so many people to suffer. And to your point, I can agree. I think a lot of guys, if they have a PS5, if they have Pornhub and they have Domino's Pizza, they can live out for a couple of years. You know what I mean? They, they can shut off emotionally and, have a, and be okay. Lights are on, AC is on, internet works, my thumb works. Generally speaking, there's, some, there's a lot of men who can be able to do that. But I really believe, like you said, the, the, the emotional and spiritual detachment to life is really felt by a lot of women. And you made a great point, which kind of segues into you know, where I really want to have a conversation with you about um, 2010 and how there's been a shift in regards to how men and women connect. And one of those biggest biggest shifts occurred with dating apps. And so I really enjoyed some of your, your takes on dating apps. And, and I actually shared some ideas with some people and they gave me some pushback. So I want to, I want to, I want to get that to you as well. But from, from your research, what do you think is the sentiment in regards to dating apps from men and women today? Yeah, I mean, there's been uh, there's been some some interesting sort of empirical research from psychologists, other social scientists on, you know, what what it like, what is this sort of subjective experience of using these apps? You know, how do how do men and women uh, sort of respond to them? How do they use them? And it seems that uh, they're they're actually not uh, they're not that that beneficial. I mean, it's I think the original intent of Tinder and all of these apps was was to make life easier. Right. Like, oh, you know, for people who are busy or on the go, you have an app and you can just sort of find a partner. Maybe you don't have time. And it was supposed to be, I think, the sort of side, um, like the side option to find someone for busy people. Uh, but then if you look at research, you know, there's research coming out of like Stanford showing that now, especially for young people, dating apps and online dating are like by far the most common way that young people meet. And you know, you know, more so than through, through friends or through, you know, in person and so on. And, you know, women, the response for many of them seems to be like this sense of um, like, like on average anyway, like this sort of choice uh, paralysis, this kind of abundance mm -hmm. because they, you know, they often get many, many matches. I mean, I remember I was working once with this, with this girl and she, you know, she, she showed me like her Tinder and she had like, I don't know, a few hundred matches. Like, you know, she's like, just download this like three days ago, and, like all these, all these matches. And she's like, you know, trying to like, you know, asking me like, what about this? Going on? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I have no idea how to navigate something like that. If you have 300 matches, how do you choose like which ones to go on a date with? And yeah. so there is this sort of sense of a, a, a like overwhelmingness and for guys, what I'm seeing, and, and this is sort of reflected in the research too, sort of when you interview guys and ask them about Tinder, it seems like um, a lot of frustration. Uh, most guys don't get that many matches. Uh, you know, they seem to not get as, as many dates as they'd hoped for. Um, so if you want to know like the actual stats on, you know, how many people get likes or swipe rights or whatever, um, at least on Tinder for uh men on average uh like about 60 percent of the women's profiles they see on on tinder and it's probably roughly the same for the other apps as well whereas for women they tend to only like about four percent of the apps mm. they see and so you can see this sort of asymmetry here where you know probably those four percent of guys you know the four percent of guys that women tend to swipe on are roughly the same guys right and so what this means is that like four percent of guys are getting maybe about 60 percent of the matches give or take and yeah. there's some different different uh, findings on this but roughly that's the case that a small number of men are getting an overwhelming number of the matches i've talked before about a friend of mine who um you know he's, he's a pretty good looking guy but he really just mastered uh photography and scenery mm -hmm. and lighting and everything and yeah, he he got um, something like twenty thousand plus matches on Tinder That's and crazy. You know, other other apps too. And 
I mean, he, uh, but that's not the typical male experience by any means. Uh, my other friends, yeah. you know, a lot of them just get like a couple matches here and there. It's not that, you know, it's not, not that great for them. And so, um, it seems like it's actually making people less happy. So again, I, 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 I talked about that, the research on, on, you know, do, do women and men think that things are like dating life? Has it gotten better or worse? And most women say it's gotten worse. I think men are like 50, 50, half say it's gotten better, half say it's gotten worse. I wonder why the the discrepancy there, but um, a lot of the young guys I see, they're they're really not happy with what's going on. I mean, the numbers of uh, ghosting, uh, you know, ghost, you know, disappearing, like seeing someone and then never seeing them again. I'm, you know, this is happening a lot more too. The research is indicating because, you know, in the past, if you meet someone through a friend. And then maybe you're not getting along anymore. You can't just vanish because you have the same yeah. social circle, the peer group. You're going to see each other again somehow just, you know, because you're in the same community. But with dating apps, you know, you can literally hook up with someone and then delete them from the app, block them on social media. And that's the end of it. Right. Um, I've yeah. you know, multiple of my guy friends and my female friends have told me, you know, they've seen a guy like there was a girl I knew. So my, my ex-girlfriend, her best friend was seeing a guy for like six months they were planning to meet his parents. They were going to like go away for the weekend to meet his parents. And then the day before they were scheduled to make this trip, he texted her and said something like, um, I don't I don't think this is actually going to work. I'm so sorry for the short notice. Goodbye. And deleted her number, blocked her on everything. And oh, wow. he like, and yeah, I think they were like, you know, they were supposed to like move or something. And yeah, just That's completely crazy. ghosted. Yeah. And I've, you know, I'm sure like, you know, you and many of the listeners and whatever, like a lot of people have stories like this, either themselves or they know this has happened to someone. And like, clearly this isn't good, right, for for sort of the romantic and dating scene uh, for young people. I really feel bad for, for, for people who um, are sort of going through this and trying to find someone. It's tough. So here's here's some of the, the theories I have, and, I'm, and I want to bounce these ideas off you. Do you think the discrepancy between males and females in regards to women only liking 4% of guys on average and men liking 60%. Do you believe that's a byproduct of the apps or do you believe it's a byproduct of human nature? Hmm. That's an interesting question, man. You know, so, you know, what are like, I guess, you know, there's been research on like, what causes people to swipe uh, right or like, you know, the profiles they see. There was uh, some research showing, for example, that if you're like, what's the difference between having a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in your bio? And some researchers have found that if you're a man and you get a master's degree, you're about twice as likely to get a match. A woman is twice as likely to like your profile if you have a master's degree versus a bachelor's degree, which is pretty good. I mean, you know, twice, twice the odds there. Um, and for women, for women with master's degrees, it increases her chances of being liked by, I think, 10 percent. So it's just like a slight oh. increase, a slight I don't mean negative. <laughs> right. No, no, no. Positive, actually. A slight increase. But but not, you know, it's not, you yeah. know, not much. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and so, like, I, I think this indicates that it's not just about looks. I think, you know, I have a lot of like younger guy friends and stuff who ask me, you know, like, oh, these these apps, it's just about like getting good pictures and looks and everything. But I think the education thing shows that it's not just looks. I think like, yeah. you know, showing that you're an educated person can can also help as well. Um, I think it's both, though. The qu to question is like, you know, I think on average, of course, like, you know, s certain small percentage of, of guys tend to be disproportionately attractive to women, whereas, you know, guys on average tend to be more open in, in, in terms of who they like. Um, the problem, though, is that, like, often, you know, there's, with, with some exceptions and whatever, but on average, say, I think if you're perhaps not, like, the most attractive-looking guy, but, um, you know, if a girl can get a sense of your vibe and sort of, like, how you are and your personality and sort of how you get along with other people, seeing you interact with others and how you sort of um, engage in the social scene and so on, I think that can often make up for maybe not being the most attractive guy or the most, I don't know, athletic or whatever, the way that, um, you know, th those kinds of characteristics that, that really appeal on the apps where you see, you know, shirtless selfies or whatever. Um, and you can't necessarily demonstrate your social uh, yeah. intelligence or whatever on an app the way that you can in real life. Um, and yeah. so, so basically like, yeah, if you're a good looking guy, regardless if it's an app or in real life, you're going to have more options than an average yeah, looking yeah, yeah. guy. Right. But again, like if you're, 
really good looking but socially clumsy or awkward or whatever versus like maybe a more average looking guy who's really sort of socially aware and and adept and so on like you know you could have you could it could be sort of leveling the playing field a bit so sort of moving all of these dating interactions and options and everything like moving it all online i think is sort of narrowing um yeah. people's ability to display and demonstrate their their attractiveness this isn't just us just for men I mean, to some degree it's for for women as well um but i think like what's going on now is you're getting like a small number of guys on the apps just getting a ton of attention yeah so i have two two theories about this so the first the first one is that in regards to the idea of disproportionate amount of men and women, I mean, um, women than men getting matches. The first thing I thought about, and this is a general theory that somebody once said, I had a friend who once told me, he said that for men to be friends, all it takes is one thing. And by that means you, you like Jordan Peterson, I like Jordan Peterson, we're friends. You like football, I like football, we're friends. You like hunting, I like hunting, we're friends. It usually takes one thing to generally bond guys together. And then on the flip side, it usually takes one thing for women to not bond together. So they can have <laughs> nine things in common, but if okay. she doesn't like the way she choose no if she isn't like the way the show she watches no it, it just takes one thing for them to not connect for god it just takes one thing for them to connect so how that plays that out on dating apps i see is that for guys generally speaking obviously like usually for the average guy if a woman has one thing Maybe she has a good, pretty face or a decent body or looks okay. Like, generally speaking, they're like, you know, I'll try it. You know, they'll, they'll, they're open to try it. But then on the flip side, a guy can be tall and, and, and handsome and successful, but maybe in his bio he had a couple typos, he's disqualified. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's what the, the apps have done is that the – the natural way, I, I, another theory of mine, I have a lot of theories, <laughs> but I, I argue that the natural way most people met and dated was not because of attraction that came from just looking at somebody, but the attraction that came from building with somebody over time. I call it my PTO formula. Proximity, time, and opportunity can give you the potential for creating attraction. And so, like you said, even if you weren't the most good looking guy, if she saw you and was around you and, and, and got to experience your vibe, as you said, those things can be to your advantage. So though that one strike that would have existed on a piece of paper, she actually got to know you over time. That strike isn't as big of a deal. So I definitely do believe that the apps, as you said, give guys a huge disadvantage because I would argue that if, if you were a guy and you met 50 women in person and you're an average guy, one out of 50 would give you a date. But then on the flip side, if you're an average guy online dating, you might have to swipe 500 different people before you potentially get a date. And that's some of my theories to why there's a big disparity. No, that totally, totally makes sense. I mean, yeah, like basically all of that is consistent with like research and evolutionary psychology, for example. I mean, the sort of, this is like kind of cr like a crude way to put it, but Basically, like what seems to be the case, is, like for men, the default is like the default is I, I would sleep with a woman unless there's some reason why I shouldn't, you know, like yeah. you know, they discover, I don't know, maybe, maybe, okay, of course, like if the guy's in a relationship or whatever, but you know, there's something with the woman that leads them to not want to, but the default is they would. Whereas for women, it's the reverse is like, I don't want to sleep with any man unless there's some particular reason why I should, you know? Yeah, and, good. and so that's this really sort good. of like, you start from this, either this sort of um, acceptance versus rejection kind of mindset. Mm, that's really um, good. And so like, you know, and, and I think this plays out. I mean, so it's, it's what the apps I think are doing are they sort of like magnify what, what is already present in human nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we already really sort of good. start out from these positions just as as human beings we sort of tend to lean in certain directions as men or as women but then the app sort of like pour fuel onto this fire and really sort of amplify uh the, these kinds of preferences and characteristics and so on and and i mean the other thing i think is like you know options as well i mean i just read this paper actually i think this was on on tinder specifically though it might have been some of the other dating apps that just the knowledge 
that you can um, download. Like you can download the app and use it and find someone else, you know, within reason. I mean, of course, again, it's going to be harder for guys. But, you know, again, like you could probably find someone. And so just that knowledge that all you have to do is tap a couple buttons on your phone and, you know, you could start like seeing potential uh, romantic partners again um, means that, you know, like maybe you're not going to take your current relationship so seriously. And Mm. something like 25 percent of people who use dating apps are currently in relationships, in committed relationships, like as in their partner doesn't know that they're using the apps. (laughs) So one out of four people on the apps, you know. And yeah. so, you know, a lot of people are kind of like, you know, being secretive or coy about about using these apps on the side, too. And I think that this also creates some kind of, you know, romantic, like kind of kind of like instability in the dating landscape that no one like not only might you personally feel less committed to your partner, but the knowledge that your partner can also download an app and find someone other yeah. than you might make the relationship less stable and less secure and so on. I mean. I, I I love hearing like stories from older people, like you know, generation parents, grandparents, and so on, about how they met their husband or wife or whoever. And it's just so quaint, man. It's like you know, oh my, you know, my 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 aunt knew my you know this girl who lived in this neighborhood, and she set us up, and we started dating. And back then, you just didn't have the same amount of options. You sort of like found someone in your town, you got married, and that was it. Yeah. And, you know, um, polyamory wasn't really a thing like like cheating was cheating has always existed, but it was much more shameful back then. I think I think today we're kind of like take this more relaxed or permissive attitude about cheating the way that we didn't in the past. Um, Divorce and all these like all these things, the norms were just so different that if you found someone to get married to, like you really sort of prized and cherished that person, whereas now um, it's it's less so the case just you know again because of the sort of options and the norms have shifted yeah another thing that i really i I noticed another theory of mine i'm curious your thoughts on this as well is that i i would i i think sometimes men especially and women obviously have this nostalgia of the past and esther perel one of my favorite people of all time has great um information in regards to the the reality of dating in the past but what what I've noticed from research and articles and books and things like that is that, like, in the past, I would argue that most relationships or most marriages were purpose-based marriages. So, there, so if you were a, a woman, a lot of times you were interested in a guy who could provide, who could protect, you know, the general things that society required of it. And so you were marrying for, for that purpose. And so if I, so, so generally speaking, you know, most men could fit that purpose in society because most men were working in the, in the special industrial era and agrarian societies, most men were working. And so that's where it was advantageous. But today the challenge is that we went from like purpose-based marriage to passion-based marriage. And now what people want is the feeling, the love, the emotion, the intensity, the, 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 the mythology that's shared in Disney movies and stuff like that. And, and that is something that exists. And I, and I keep on trying to find this study. And, 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 I, and I, I really want to find it. So I'm, 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 I'm not putting it in my citations just yet. But I, was, I remember reading an article a long time ago where it said they asked women in the 1960s, if a man had everything on your list, but you weren't feeling the feeling of love, would you marry him? And I believe 90% of women said they would. And, and they asked that same question to women today. If a man had every item on your list, but you didn't feel the love for him, would you marry him? And over 90% said no. So another thing that I noticed is that that feeling, that spark, that that thing, what it is, that's something that is extremely different in the women today than the women in the past, which makes it very difficult because I would argue, going back to the dating apps, it's only a small percentage of men elicit those feelings, whether it's from attraction, whether it's from charisma, whether it's from just, you know, like them know how to game the system and present themselves in a certain image. So I really believe that even 
without the apps, even though the apps do amplify the situation, as you said, I think the, the cultural expectations that have, have been added for men and women alike also make it extremely difficult because if that feeling isn't felt, it's so easy to go to somebody else or leave that person because in their theory, that's the essence of a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very, I, I think that was well put. I mean, you know, this, this sort of basing a relationship just on like feelings. I think this is, I mean, of course, I think this is a recipe for, you know, sort of longer term instability that basically your relationship isn't going to survive that way because no matter, I mean, even for people who are in love and who have stayed in love, the feeling is always the strongest in the beginning and it sort of changes over time. I mean, very few people can, I, I don't know of any actually, like that, that could possibly like maintain that level of passion and romance, you know, that sort of honeymoon phase indefinitely. It just doesn't work that way. And Real quick, yeah. I, I'm sorry for cutting you off, Rob, but I, I was reading an interesting study that said the re you biologically can't experience that feeling for long term because you'll get a heart attack. Like the idea is like, it's like biologically oh, speaking, like we impossible. cannot keep that intense of feeling in our as a human body because you will get a heart attack. That's wild. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, well, yeah. So, so you just, yeah, you can't maintain that. And it's just, I mean, well, it sounds like it's biologically impossible, but just like, it just doesn't seem feasible in the first place. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. So, so anyway, like, so what do you do here? I mean, you like, what do you like build a relationship on and. You know, I, I think it's it's often useful to look to sort of the wisdom of the past. I mean, it doesn't have to be that far back, but, you know, our parents, our grandparents, great, great grandparents, like, you know, like, how did they stay married? And, you know, it wasn't because they found their soulmate and, you know, they elicited so much passion and that just carried them through for 50 or 60 plus years. I mean, what, what are, the, you know, our grandparents, I mean, they met in the same like small town, you know, like, what are the odds that that was like their true sort of romantic soulmate? This I, I, idea, yeah. this myth of the soulmate is, it's, I mean, it's not real. And so yeah. they they made choices, right? Like, but it, the, I think there's like, there are a couple of, you know, a couple of components to this. I mean, one is just sort of your own personal expectations about what a relationship is and how it can survive. Um, and then the other are sort of the like the, the norms around you. So that like in the past, for example, like even if maybe things weren't working out, like maybe you were a guy and you wanted to leave your family um, and you wanted to maybe go you know, meet some single women or whatever. But there were very strong and harsh social norms against mm -hmm. like being a, a guy who did that to your family, to your wife, to your kids. Yeah. And so even if you have the urge to leave, you just can't. And so you're there yeah. and you sort of like make it work. Like once you know, like, well, if I did this, then my reputation would be destroyed and everyone would hate me and so on. So you sort of stay and make it work and you try to be a good husband and a good father because those are the only option available. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, nowadays it's not necessarily the case. So such that even if you maybe know what the right choice is, have, having the knowledge that other options are available to you may make you less, less committed. I mean... Mm -hmm. You know, because people say this, they say like, you know, well, everyone already knows the statistics about single parents. They know the statistics about divorce and so on and so on. So like, you know, why do you have to talk about it or whatever? And it's like, look, you can you can know something, you can know the statistics, you can sort of know it rationally and so on. But unless the sort of the norms are pervasive and people are trying to uphold them and reminding you of them constantly, um, it's not necessarily the case that you'll follow them. And an example I give is with smoking. So everybody knows that smoking is bad for you. Nobody doesn't know that. But there were tons of norms that were put into place about like, you know, sort of shaming yeah. smokers, right? Yeah. Like, you know, that's bad for you, right? And, you know, that's hurting me too when you smoke because of the secondhand smoke, all this stuff, right? Like you had to like sort of build these norms and these new rules and regulations and all of this stuff in place. Even though we all know smoking is bad, you still have to put yeah. all those in. So I think this may also be the case with things like like family norms and relationships and so on is that you can know certain things, but it helps to be reminded and to have the the norms set up. And so, you know, on this idea of passion, I just remembered this um, this uh, passage from uh, this psychologist Roy Baumeister uh, and his co-author Diane Tice. So they wrote this 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 good book. I, I think it's out of print now, but it's called The Social Dimension of Sex, which I, I recommend. It's it's pretty entertaining. But one of the points they make is that. Um, Basically, uh, the, like the person you meet that you fall in love with, 
they're just human, meaning that um, those first few weeks you spend together, um, you're sort of like in this sense of awe at them as they tell you stories about themselves and where they grew up and where they came from and funny, funny moments in their life and their friends and all this stuff. And eventually, like no matter how interesting of a person you are, not everyone can has unlimited interesting stories. Eventually, you'll tell all of the great stories you can tell to the person you love. Yeah. You'll tell them every interesting thing about your life. They'll know everything about you. So what happens after that? You know, like, are they going to yeah. get bored with you? Are they going to leave you? Or are you going to build your relationship on something other than sort of constantly being passionate and interesting and exciting? Um, and I found that to be like kind of an interesting point there to, to, to remember this too. Because, you know, if you see like old couples together who've been around for a long time, been together a long time, you'll, you'll see that they finish each other's stories um, because they've yeah, heard yeah, it yeah. all, right? Like if you've been married, to <laughs> you've yeah, heard yeah, yeah. everything you can know. And so the guy will start telling a story and his wife will be like, oh, here he's telling this one again, but they yeah. still love each other, right? And I think this is also yeah. something important to keep in mind. Yeah. So um, when I was, t when I, when I shared um, a couple of um, articles to my friend about um, some of your, the things that we talked about today, one of the, one of the pushbacks he gave, not to you, but just to me in general, he said that one of the advantages he believes of dating apps is that the ability to meet people has become easier and that is beneficial for the average man. And I'm curious your thoughts on this because his theory is that the average, let's just say, let's just play an odds game. So let's say if you want one date, you have to approach 30 girls, right? So his theory was that the average man doesn't have as much confidence later on in life or doesn't have as much ability later on in life to meet 30 girls in a day or a week or a month. He just it's just not going to be a, a, a very feasible thing to do to meet that many people, new women. But the average guy could go on an app and meet 300 girls and potentially be able to get a date with one of them. So he was saying that even though the odds are more challenging, it does it has lowered the barrier of entry to where you're able to access more people to get a potential date. What what are your thoughts on on somebody who would say something like that? I mean, it just seems, you know, it it doesn't seem to match what we see with um sort of the numbers of young men who are single or report um, not having sex. So for example, um, there's a research indicating that between 2008 and 2018, the number of young men under 30 who report not having sex in the past year has tripled. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, so in 2008, something like roughly 10% of guys, young guys said they haven't had sex in the past year. And by 2018, it had reached about 30%. And so, you know, basically, like, those are the, the overlap, you know, that year, those are the years where smartphones and apps and all this stuff took off. Um, so, I mean, that seems to indicate that in the mid 2000s, late 2000s, before all these apps had come out, it might have been actually easier for a guy to find someone, you know, and of course, like, yeah. it, it's not like a airtight evidence, but I think it's suggestive yeah. that back then it wasn't, it wasn't that hard for a guy to find someone to, to at least hook up with, but I'd also, I mean, I don't know this for sure. I, I would, I would like to see some research on, for example, like guys in relationships, women in relationships. Ha, has that declined? I actually think it's increased. Like the number of single people has actually increased. Yeah, it um, did. over the last ten or fifteen years. Yeah, and so I think what these apps, basically for the average guy at least, um, it's actually been detrimental in terms of the ability to to meet someone. Um, yeah. And to stay with them, right? Like maybe you'll get a date. Like it, it's possible that just going on the apps may be easier to get a date just through swiping so many times. But then to find someone and commit to them and know that they'll commit to you and like, you know, have a relationship together. Um, I think it's become harder for for the average guy. But but for like the top guy, for guys who are, you know, really, you know, good looking or high status or whatever, it's, you know, I think the apps have been um, like sort of a treasure trove for a lot yeah. of them. So, and, and yeah, I don't necessarily know like the too much about the, at least as much about the women's experience of them, but it seems to me that a lot of yeah. women aren't really uh, sort of so thrilled about, you know, guys they meet on the apps. So. Yeah. And, and my, this is my theory in regards to the, the women thing. I think, I think what happens is that, like you said, um, 
Women are valuable by nature to men because they give you, there is a sexual opportunity, right? And men, generally speaking, highly value um, novel sex. So new sex with new people is like most guys, if, 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 if it was on the menu, they order it, you know? Like generally speaking, most guys will order it. And obviously women, like you said, come from a different perspective. So I think what, what troubles women the most is that in the world of dating apps, my theory is that you have options, but what you really have is a myriad of sexual options. So if 99% of guys will swipe right to you, probably the, the ones that you want, obviously, that's important for ladies. If 99% of guys they want, if you're a very attractive woman, will swipe right to you, probably only five of them want you for something after sex. So I okay. think that's one of the things that's maybe as more frustrating because it, it, there's a lot of options, but the options presented in front of them is a myriad of sexual options um, all, all primarily. And I think what also happens is because they're so selective during the apps, the guys that they're selecting are statistically less likely to be open to, to monogamy. Like you yeah. said, if they're all selecting 4% of the guys, that means the guy is having choices of 10, 15, 20 women at a time. So that so your natural inclination to select the guy on the top of the dominance hierarchy will then lead to that guy also being have an abundance of options, like a Genghis Khan type character. And by interacting and dating a guy like that, that probably creates a lot of hurt and frustration because though he's open to sleep with you, he may not be open to stay with you. So I think that's maybe right. what happens with women. So there's, yeah, I guess the, the, the rejection comes at different points. So for guys, the rejection is basically upfront. You're swiping on a bunch of women, maybe I love you get a that. few matches. And the vast majority of them don't want to date you. You might see them once they never see you again. But the women, it's like you you go on the date, you hook up, but then afterwards you get rejected. And that's I love painful that, man. in its own way. It's probably more I love painful. that. So I thought about it, the exact theory. It's like a triangle, right? Mm. So for my theory is generally speaking, if you're a guy, like the bit you're you're the triangle. So at the top of the triangle is the is the is the entry. And the top of the triangle is how many girls will come in here? So mm. if you want to have sex with, with a girl, generally speaking, it's probably not that many girls as a guy who are open to having sex with you. But if they are open to having sex with you, I truly believe you. it's very likely that she would be open to dating and a relationship with you. So kind of like it leads, it's wider as you progress forward. So the moment you get through, like you said, that initial barrier of entry, the more time you spent, it's a lot easier for her to want to be with you. And so I think for women, it's inverted, right? So at the beginning of all these guys that want to have sex with you, oh, yeah, yeah, but as yeah. time progresses with that guy, there's maybe not that many that will want to be in a relationship with you. So I think you, you, you hit the nail directly on the head. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually reminds me of some, some research on this. Um, I think from, from David Buss, who's an amazing evolutionary psychologist, but I think the, the finding was something like for certain kinds of guys, I can't remember like the specific type. I mean, I think these were like basically desirable kinds of guys um, specifically right after they have sex with a girl, their uh, attraction to the girl plummets. Um, mm. And so like right before they hook up, they're really interested in having sex. And then, you know, immediately after they've, you know, committed the act, it's like, you know, I don't, they don't really like them that much. And, and this post ejaculation happen, think, realization. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the post not clarity kind of thing. And so it's like, you know, basically right after this, you know, and, and these are the guys who women tend to like the most is like right after they mm -hmm. tend to not be so attract attracted. And of course, this doesn't mean this can happen to every girl. I mean, of course, like a lot of these guys do eventually end up in relationships and so on. A lot of like high status, wealthy kinds of guys still get married and settle down and whatever. But for the vast majority of women that they they do sleep with throughout their lives, they don't really feel anything for them. I mean, of course, like right immediately before they they they're really interested, and then immediately after they're not so much. And you know, I was thinking about this. You know, it's even even these sort of like you know guys who are at the top of the 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 hierarchy, the most desirable guys. A lot of these guys, even they aren't like super 
ha- not all of them anyway, seem to be really happy with with what's going on with with the apps. I mean, I had a friend. I was talking to him recently, early two thousand twenty. So like right right like after the lockdowns had been announced, he just basically downloaded all the apps and like had a different girl over every day. Um, he was like, well, I'm working from home. Like, who cares? Like, might as well have some fun while I'm here. It was like, you know, like breaking all the, the lockout orders and whatever, like bringing different girls over. And he said, like, after about three months of this, he felt disgusted with himself. Yeah. Um, because like, as a guy, it's a weird thing, right? Like, you know, there's, there's actually sort of different like dopamine pathways here about like wanting versus liking. you can really want something, but actually not like it, which is actually what happens with yeah. drug addicts too. It's like, you can really crave something, but then you do it and you actually don't really enjoy it. And this, I think this was happening with him, yeah. And uh, and he was hooking up with these girls, and he couldn't help it because the option was there. And he'd bring a girl over, and then immediately after, he would just be like, well, why did I do this again? Yeah. And so his job offered him the chance to go on furlough and, like, take a pay cut and basically just go on, on job furlough. A lot of, a lot of uh, firms were doing this last year. And he went to Israel on, like, a religious retreat and, like, hoping to sort of you know, like replenish, cleanse himself, like yeah. turn over a new leaf, whatever. Like, oh, I can't believe I did all that stuff. And now I'm going to be like, you know, this different person. He comes back to the U.S. And like a week later, he downloads all the apps again, does the same exact thing. Like, yeah. he, you know, because, you know, the option is there. And I think if you're a yeah. guy in your mid late 20s and you're single and you're making good money and whatever, it's like you you just you can't help but be drawn to that. And so even for those guys, I don't think the apps are necessarily always um, fun or. You no, know, I agree they're, with they're you hundred percent because what I've also noticed is that the highly desirable guys, their their stories are very similar with the highly desirable women, and what mm. ends up happening is the the first thing is that, par- like you said, a paradox of choice. Like yeah. the more options that you have, you constantly feel FOMO. So for yeah. most guys, the options are just the girls on Instagram and the girls on Pornhub, right? That's the options they have and not real options. But for guys, when you actually have 20 girls on your phone that actually want to be with you, like it's hard for you to appreciate one because you have 19 more on your roster. So like you, like that affects you as well. But what I also noticed is that the unfortunate thing about apps is that it, 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 it drives, like you said, exacerbates sexual novelty. And when you when you value sexual novelty, when you value, you know, superficiality and beauty, you tend to diminish the things that really matter. So, yes, you're swiping with these really attractive women, but do these really attractive women have equally as valuable substance? So what I've seen is that these guys get used to sleeping with all these very, very attractive women. um, And that becomes their expectation. That becomes their new sexual palate and appetite. But then. These women usually don't have the substance and, and value and, 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 and principle and characters that lead to long term sustainable relationships. And so now they really can't be content with uh, maybe a, a above average looking girl who has great personality because they're so enticed. They're so obsessed with a certain look and they're so used to this that it tends to perpetuate the cycle where you constantly date just for beauty and you constantly lose the out on the character. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially when you're young, you don't think so much about this is Yeah. I mean, every like every act and every sort of sexual partner you have, like it, it leaves like an imprint on you. Like you can't yeah. just like have, you know, sex with with unlimited numbers of partners and not have it and and, and pay some kind of cost for it. Yeah. And I, 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 so I've seen research, for example, showing that the, the more sexual partners you have, the, the more likely you are to, to get divorced. Like if you do get married. I saw that too. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this does like, I mean, of course, you know, so, some people call this you know, in question. Some people say like, oh, well, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to have lots of sex with different people and then you get married, maybe you're just that kind of person who's unhappy in marriage and wants to have sex with more kinds of people. It's possible. But I do think there is something here going on where you just – you're you can't be satisfied once you sort of live that life whereas you know in the past when you had one partner and that was all you you ever had you appreciate that person that much more um 100 and so it's you know it's a sort of trade-off here about like you can have these these options available to you but you know often yeah what it, what it seems like is that people aren't aren't that happy i mean i've never seen this done specifically for uh apps or or dating although i'm sh- I'm sure it applies but you know there's these kind of like very simple psychology experiments um 
where you present people with options for um, like different kinds of jams, like, you know, there's like strawberry and peach and like, you know, there's like six different jams and you ask people to to pick one. Um, so, you know, give them six versus if you give them 20, uh, yep. if you present them with six options and they pick one, they tend to be happier with their option and they tend yep. to have less regret than if you give them 20 options and they pick one. Well, first, they're less likely to pick one because there's too many of them. And when they yeah. do pick one, they feel more regret and uncertainty because they're like, well, was this really the right jam? Did I really like it? And because there's so many options there. And I think this is happening now with with dating too, or you know, maybe in the past you had a few options, you pick one and you're like, well, I only had a few options, so this is probably the best I can do. And now it's like unlimited and you never know, right? Like you never know if this is, if, if there's someone else out there who might be a better fit or, you know, even if they're not, like as a guy, it's not always about fit. It's just about, like you said, novelty and having different sex partners and, yeah, there's a. I think the apps have have created a lot of a lot of obstacles. Yeah, and Lori Gottlieb's book. I, um, there's such a um, um, case for marry uh, marry him. The case for marry marry Mister Good Enough. Her book. Mm. There was a there was a, a passage where they said there's a statistical number where after you meet X amount of people, statistically speaking, your best partner is in that group of people. So I think the theory was like. If you meet 40, if you go on 47 dates, after 47 is law of diminishing returns. <laughs> like, so it's just basically the idea is that once you go on this certain number of dates, find whoever you connected with the best. And statistically speaking, that's going to be the highest percentage of you being happy relationship. So I even thought about a potential app and it probably wouldn't work because people are just, people are heeding this nowadays, but an app where you only <laughs> can get one match a day. Like, it's a hand-picked match. We give you a match a day. I mean, sorry, a week. One a week. And yet, a year to be on this app. <laughs> so after a year, you get booted. And if you haven't found somebody, we've given you 52 choices. You have a limited amount of choices. We only get one a week. But that's just my theory. But I want to ask you that in closing. I know I took a, lot, a little bit more of your time than expected, but it's such a great conversation. We talked a lot about the problems, and I just don't want to leave anyone feeling hopeless, you know, cynical, nihilistic. Like I said, there's a lot of content online that preys on nihilism and, and hopelessness and frustration about today. What would you say is some advice you would give to men or women who, who feel um, hopelessness about today's dating market, who heard this episode and was like, man, dating sucks, apps suck. What are hopes that they can do? What are things that changes they can make to be able to improve that you've seen from studies, from experiences, and just your own personal research? Yeah, I mean, it's, a bit, it's a big question. Um, I mean, so for guys, you know, I, I think uh, one thing that guys can do both to sort of improve their confidence and, and of course, just to improve their appearance, I actually think is, uh, is, is, is finding some kind of workout routine or fitness regimen. I mean, if you're already on one, that's great. But a lot of guys aren't. Surprisingly, a lot of young guys aren't. And I think, of course, there are the immediate sort of um, uh, physical appearance benefits. But I think there's uh, at least as valuable as the sort of self-confidence that guys can gain from doing that. I mean, I I was sort of like this in high school where, you know, I, I started working out and yeah, just generally felt better about myself. And I think a lot of guys can benefit from that, too. I've talked to young guys who do this, like they start lifting weights. And, and if you're young, too, I mean, you start seeing be uh, results even after only a couple of weeks. New uh, beginnings. Because you have a lot of testosterone in your body and you're young yeah. and you have like your body just naturally is stimulated in response to 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 working out. So that's 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 like possibly one thing you can do. Um and I think another is to to try not to like indulge in in a lot of the toxicity online. I see a lot of guys like they share these very like dark memes and they sort of wallow in all of this. Like I almost think like some people get this sort of like pleasure out of it or something about like do. lamenting how bad things are. And yeah. if you really want to improve your life, um, you know, exposing yourself to that stuff isn't helping you, you know, like, so I, I, I'm on, I'm on Twitter a lot and like I block and mute and like, just like try to er erase that negativity to, you know, to the extent that I can, because it's, it's just going to sort of infect and pollute your mind and your thinking and your, and your worldview. And how is it going to help you to, yeah. to, to be put in that mindset? So, so yeah, try to limit that and expose yourself to, to positivity and to uh, to people and ideas that will sort of um, uh, cultivate a better mindset. I love it. No, the, and that's it. those are the two biggest things I tell people. The first, like you said, is self improvement. 
Like everybody can improve. Everybody can get better. Everybody can grow. And though it's challenging, it's not, a, it's not impossible. And my philosophy in life is if somebody can win, why not you? If somebody can meet a good partner, if someone can have a good life, if someone can have good health, if somebody can be financially free, why not you? So I definitely wholeheartedly believe in your message about, you know, there is, in the midst of all what's wrong, there are people who are succeeding and growing and improving. Um, so I, I love that first part. And the last part, you hit the nail on the head. If all you, if all you do on the news is watch how bad a certain group of people are, you're going to grow animosity and anger to those group of people. You're going to demonize them. Typical example, if all you saw was Muslims crashing planes into buildings, whenever you saw a Muslim, your brain is going to view them as the bad guy. And so it's very important for individuals, as you said, to be careful about the negativity and cynicism as well as what beliefs that you're putting into your mind, going back to your luxury beliefs conversation. It's so powerful. Be careful the ideas that you're consuming because a lot of ideas people are projecting might potentially, quote unquote, in theory, work for them, but it will definitely be detrimental for you. So, Rob, I really appreciate you today. Man, this is such a great episode. Where can people find you at? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they can find me. So my website is robkhenderson.com and uh, yeah, on Twitter at Rob K. Henderson. This is this is great. Hafiz. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. So, guys, you know, how we get down. Please reach out to Rob. Let him know what about this episode stood out to you guys. He's such a bright mind. I look forward to all the wisdom to provide us in the future. My name is Hafiz and I'm joined by Rob Henderson. We are the roommates and have a great day. Mm-hmm.